I'm going to record to the clip. And even with the recorded session, please don't hesitate to ask candid, vulnerable, direct personal questions, because I think <laughs> I just think it's very important that we are real in the midst of what's happening. But Ben, I'll pass it to you to get us started. Yeah, I'm going to I think I'm going to do this spotlighting thing. I'm going to spotlight myself first and then I'll, I'll bring you in because I want to just welcome people as, as one of the uh, conveners, the co-conveners of this event, along with uh, Melina Angel and Isabel Carlisle, and we've been assisted in, in enormous ways also by Lauren Minnis, uh, as well as the rest of the Regenerative Communities Network, sort of core folks, our global council and conveners. Um, we're so excited to be hosting this summit and to be featuring people like Joe Brewer uh, as one of the wayfinders that we're highlighting over the two weeks that we're gathering. Um, just want to say a couple words about our intentions here. You know, our, we're gathering to explore um, emerging opportunities for radical collaboration in service to bioregional regeneration. The Regenerative Communities Network was formed as a, a network of nodes of bioregions um, that are looking to do regenerative work. It was originally created by the Capital Institute, but has been independent for a while now. And this is kind of a coming out party for us in a way to, to be hosting this summit. And Joe was a very um, prominent part of the earlier iteration of, of the network and really helped to get it launched in, in many ways. And then um, I think he may talk about how his work now with Earth Regenerators and the work on the ground in Barichara built upon you know, what he learned and, and got inspired uh, about um, through his time with, with RCN. Um, and that's maybe enough to say to introduce him. I'll, I'll just also say that I had the pleasure of meeting Joe uh, as part of an initiative called Leading for Wellbeing that became the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, uh, which is also in the house here in the summit. Um, and network to network collaboration is one of our, our themes or our areas of inquiry. Um, Earth Regenerators is, a, is an amazing network. We have a lot of people showing up from that, uh, the network that Joe uh, has created and um, and there's so many other networks as well that that are aligned in many ways. So that's that's part of what we're looking at as well as how do bioregions learn from each other, bioregional exchange. How do we move money in in effective ways and use the bioregional scale? That's going to be another main theme I think of our conversation with Joe, where he's doing really innovative work in that regard. Uh, and finally, how do we resource ourselves personally um, as we as we grapple with these challenges? Um, that we face at all these other scales. So that's our that's our context for this. And having said that, uh, let me bring Joe in. Oh, I just have to. There you are right at the top of things. And and um, and Joe, we we're really I think we're just going to ask two questions of you um, and let you speak for about twenty minutes. Um, so ten minutes per question. Maybe the first question will be more like a five minute question, and then. And then longer after that, um, and then we'll open it up for for Q and A, um, and and let you respond to people and, and wrap up a little bit before the top of the hour. How's that sound? Sounds great. Let's do it. I'm noticing I'm looking over there because my the screen is large. Um, yeah. So welcome. Thank you so much for for joining us and uh, for doing the inspiring work that you're doing. Um, the first the first question. Uh, relates to this concept of, of radical collaboration in service to bioregional regeneration. And um, I'm curious if there's a specific story of something you experienced that you might share with us that was a kind of a peak experience that in some way relates to, to that, to, the, to those ideas of radical collaboration and, and bioregional regeneration. Some, some, some little anecdote you could tell us that were really, you know, was a high point for you and, and um, kind of what you might hope we would see much, much more of. Uh, actually, I have one that happened recently, just a few weeks ago, because we were able to bridge from some of the deepest indigenous wisdom holding practices in Colombia to like web three crypto practitioners. And so thinking of radical collaboration, I mean, radical as in getting right to the, the, the root of the human experience, and then to be able to bring together very diverse actors and what, what happened was this, we had an event called Refi Barichara, which happened a few weeks ago. And it was sandwiched between two of the largest cryptocurrency events in the world that both happened to be in Colombia this year. 
There was Cosmoverse in Medellin, and then there was DevCon for Ethereum that was in Bogota. And what happened that was really amazing was we have this incredible network of local projects in Barichara. So there are just amazing, all of the work that's here, uh, you know, like regenerative agroforestry and healing circles for collective trauma and everything in between. And what we did was we asked a couple of the local medicine women if they would get, create an opening ritual and a closing ritual for this five day event that we were having. And of course the women being really connected to the land and really connected to the history of you know, 500 years of colonialism and all of the ways that outside experts, even with good intentions, distort the field. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of sensitivity in this topic. And what they felt was that they shouldn't have a ceremony that could be like a, you know, like a tourist experience or just someone observing. So to have a, an opening ceremony with our participants didn't feel appropriate to them. Although we actually had an opening ritual and a closing ritual with another medicine woman who was part of the group. So we ended up having this blended space. But what they felt they needed to do was they felt they needed to sit for seven full days. So we had a five day experience starting one day before and ending one day after. And during the entire time, there was a group of women who sat with a fire and just kept feeding the fire and tending it to hold the connection between what the territory wants and what our intentions are. And then trying to, in the way of, especially inspired by the Kogi tradition, but also the Mawiska Federation uh, has, has a lot of these practices as well. Where we live, the Guane people are from this region and the genocide of their culture was largely successful. So it'd be difficult to have a fully authentic indigenous experience from this territory. So they did the best that they could, blending what they know. And what they wanted to do is hold this sense that, and this is really expressed in the Kogi tradition very clearly, that when there's any kind of conflict or problem in the larger field that they're operating in, they hold very special cleansing ceremonies to come back into right relationship with themselves and with the life-giving qualities of the land. And they do this when there's like violence in a neighboring village and they wanna restore the peace. They have practices like this that are thousands of years old that are absolutely essential and are completely alien to the modern world. Right. <laughs> and so, so what ended up happening um, was that the holding of this container of these women sitting with the fire somewhere in the territory, not at our event, but having continual exchanges of information. So the women holding the fire were updated continually about what was happening in our event. And in our event, we kept reminding people that the women were sitting with the fire. And this created a space where one thing that happened, which happens at a lot of conferences and large events, is someone started acting out their traumas in a way that created some um, messiness and what you could say are problems in quotes, you know, making a problematic field. And we actually had a couple of um, medicine women from other cultures, including an elder from Indonesia, who was with us at the time of the event. So speaking of radical collaboration, we actually did wisdom holding across indigenous cultures across the planet. This is like 60 people at this event. This was not a big event, but it was big and complex enough that there was a person acting out their traumas in a way that was disruptive to the group process. And we could have easily just expelled that person and silenced them. And actually there was a moment where I did have to expel the person to keep them from interrupting the flow of the group. And this is when the, this, these women, these healers came together and found a way to reincorporate this person and the whole dynamic of the group without it being about any individual person. Mm. And so without going into more detail, you can already sense how this is radical uh, collaboration. So powerful, in fact, that after the event ended, we had an appreciation gathering at the home of two of the organizers, these two women, Yvonne and Natalia, who live here in Barichara and just do wonderful work. And at their home, we invited the women who tended the fire. We invited the people who were in the field sites, the on the ground projects that our participants attended, and then the participants from the outside. And we shared in a circle of about 40 people, what did this, this event mean to us? And there's a language that's used by some of the indigenous people of South America saying that there are three worlds 
There's the world of the ancestral indigenous lifeways. There's the world of civilizations and modernity. And then there's a third world, which is the world, this is sometimes in North America called the story of the eagle and the condor, the coming together of ancient wisdom traditions with modern science and technology and creating a third world. And what was expressed in this closing circle was that the entire event was held in the third world. It was held in the blended world of ind indigenous wisdom and modern science and technology. And this felt like as radical a kind of collaboration as we could imagine achieving. And we didn't even aspire to achieve it. We just aspired to be respectful to local culture. And we somehow managed to get to this depth. And so this is the story I wanted to share to really give a sense of how radical radical in the sense of going to the root causes, we were able to achieve collaboration simply because there was so much trust and so much alignment, which is something else we could talk about if we want to. But I'll, I'll stop here and let us move to the next uh, to the next topic and just let this tantalize all of us uh, to even think that this is possible to do. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, it, it um... It addresses what I imagine is is a very common question or concern that people have when they learn that that you as a gringo have swooped into Barichara and are, you know, attempting to create all of this regenerative work and you know the, the, so that the way that you're describing that you've not just honored but integrated and and collaborated deeply with with the people there and and some of the ancient traditions and wisdom there is um, is quite beautiful to hear. Um, as as well as that there is this blending that that's part of the answer right so often we we hear in these circles about the importance of indigenous wisdom and sometimes it's it's the assumption is you know somehow that we're going to that that, that is the answer as opposed to the the, the eagle and the condor flying together um, so I, I really appreciate this story uh, the next the next question really is just our calling question um, and perhaps in the context of funding in particular because we did highlight that um, in the in the calendar um, so it's it's again what opportunities are are emerging what do you see emerging for radical collaboration in service to bioregional regeneration and in, in particular in, in the funding domain so looking forward now um, to what you see possible what's what's inspiring you right now and what do you think has transformational potential for for the wider field and maybe mm. for people that are listening to this right now or, or that will be on a recording. Mm, I want to start by saying that uh, as some of you may know we have had some success at decolonizing money of purchasing land and decolonizing land and also stimulating integration of local projects at a landscape scale. So here in Barichara we have been practicing this for more than two years. And um, so just starting with this, that what I wanna share now is a blend of direct experience from my own life. So I'm gonna be sharing some of what we've been doing and what it's like to be me, the guy who was born in Missouri in the United States to come to a landscape like this. Um, where actually Melina here uh, is with us. Um, her uncle lived here for a long time and was one of the knowledge holders of weaving practices across South America. You know, she could tell you a lot more about the local culture and its depth than I could. But I actually think it's helpful to be a translator, to be someone from the outside who, who is at least learning enough and becoming familiar enough to give an honest account of both my own distortions of the local field and what I think the local field is because I'm able to collaborate deeply with people here in Colombia. And one of the things that was really powerful when we started this process of bringing money into the landscape was first, it triggered a lot of trauma responses. And for those of you who don't know, Colombia is like, you know, the spear point of the conquistadors into South America. Some of the worst things that colonization did uh, were done here 500 years ago. And up to the present, Colombia is number one in per capita, number one in assassinations of environmental and indigenous leaders uh, up to present. I think 600 uh, environmental leaders have been assassinated in the last year. So just to really hold the presence of what it means to distrust outsiders who come with, you know, the white flag waving in the air and money and opportunity and what it can mean to a local person, how easily this can legitimately trigger fear 
distrust, skepticism about intentions. And so uh, it's very, very important to name that before telling the story I'm about to tell. Because the story I wanna tell is in two parts. One is I wanna briefly tell the story of a nature reserve called Origen del Agua. And then I wanna tell the story of creating, okay, I'm gonna use some technical language, um, validator liquidity staking pools and collaborative finance models from the crypto world. Like how the hell can we bridge these things in just a few minutes? So what I wanna say is that there are profoundly new ways to collaborate and scale our collaborations using digital organizing and communication tools, but mostly they are not based in real human trust. Actually, those of you who know blockchain know that the power of blockchain in a sense is the technology tells you the information's valued, valid, and you don't have to trust a human who might lie to you. They're called trust. You don't have to know who it is. Yeah. And so here I'm talking about going exactly the opposite. Let's go into deep trust and deep human relationship and then leverage digital tools. So that's where we're going to go in the next few minutes. And so first I want to tell the story of Origen de Lago. Origen del Agua is you know, Spanish for the origin of water. It's a place where water begins. And it's also specifically a three hectare piece of heavily eroded land. So what happened is in our territory in, here in Barichara, which is in the place in the Northern Andes where they're going Northeast and make a sharp turn toward Panama. We're right in that tangle of canyons and rivers in Colombia in a unique ecosystem called the High Andes Tropical Dry Forest. There are a lot of tropical dry forests in the world. This is the only one that mixes cloud, fat, uh, cloud forest with desert plants. And it's like eight out of 10 species only exist here, nowhere else on earth. And more than 90% of this type of forest has been cut down for monoculture crops. So it's, it's a high risk biodiversity ecology context. But also it's a place where there has been immense violence. And 40 years ago, 50 years ago, if you can imagine the village of Villanueva, which is this town of 10,000 people, it's a sister to Barichara. This was the most violent place in Colombia for about 40 years. And now it's an island of stability and peace. And people say, yeah, Barichara is special because it's so rich and stable and peaceful. And people have no idea that this was the most violent place in Colombia half a century ago. And so there's actually, for those of you who are interested, there's an amazing documentary you can find on YouTube called La Paz Anonima by Fundación Ojo de Agua that tells this story and it has English subtitles uh, for those who don't speak Spanish. And so you can learn that the local people constructed their own piece. Yeah, it's La Paz Anonima. Um, maybe Melina, if you could just write that into the chat for people. Uh, and it's Ojo de Agua, which is the eye of water, which is a local foundation that does community education work with theater and filmmaking. And so um, what I want to tell is the story of this piece of land I visited, heavily eroded. I mean, it looked like a bomb site. It was so destroyed. And it turned out that this piece of land, which is at the top of an aquifer system on a ridge line, which is the groundwater supply for the village of Barichara, and at the top of one of the tributaries of the Barichara River, which is this river with a drainage basin of about 30,000 hectares of land, that is a dead river. When you get to the waterfall where the water runs off the edge, there's no water running off the edge. The only water running off the edge of that cliff is the, um, the toilet water of Bari Cha run, running out of a pipe completely unfiltered because of local corruption by the local mayor's office. Kind of a, a typical Latin American story. And so we have this juxtaposition of a dead river a just a basically destroyed piece of land that's heavily eroded and a lot of people doing regenerative work in the area. So you can just see the, the complexity and the paradox of this place. And this piece of land uh, was owned by a family that had their grandfather um, had owned all of the land. And when he died, all of his children inherited it. And then when all of those children died, they parcelized or divided the land either even further and gave it to the grandchildren. And so I was in this process of crowdfunding money to buy a piece of land that was collectively owned by six brothers and sisters, five brothers and a sister, who were the grandchildren of this older Campesino family who had parcelized and divided it. And what was interesting was each of the grandchildren had their own farm. But this was the piece of land that no one owned because multiple of them owned it together. 
So those of you, you know, like Scotland and Ireland and these stories of the redheaded stepchild, the forgotten part of the family who's just neglected and ignored, this piece of land was kind of like that. It was a piece of land where all of the farmland around it was owned by the brothers and sisters who were all doing different kinds of monoculture agriculture. And they're in a part of the territory that is the most expensive land because rich bankers from Bogota had bought most of it and are selling it to tourists on the outside. And the only part of this section of the territory still owned by campesinos is this little river valley. And all of the brothers and sisters are selling. So it's one family who owns all the land in this drainage. And they're selling this piece of land that they collectively own, but no one's responsible for it. So when we raised the money to buy the land, we began a six month negotiation using two things. We used pro-social, which is we used a way of creating frameworks of healing and collaboration within small groups. And we engaged very actively in decolonization. So we said things like, we have the money to buy this land, but we will not buy this land until we talk about your ancestors, because this is your family's land. You know, the family we're buying it from is their grandfather's land. It was their parents' land, their aunts and uncles' land. We cannot talk about this purchase without bringing in the ancestors. You can imagine these tough, stoic, 70-year-old campesino men weeping, crying openly as they talked about how they watched their own land destroyed by their own family and the shame that they felt and the trauma that was involved. This was like an intimate, delicate process. And then later we said, we also won't buy the land unless we talk about the grandchildren because this land is bought with crowdfunding money. And so it's not like Joe, this gringo here is not buying this land. This land is being bought for the territory, but in a form of ownership, we don't know what it is yet because we want to give it back to the family and the community only if they collaborate with us to become stewards of the land, which means we had to decolonize the local people as an outsider from North America brought money. You can see how, how weird and subtle this is. And we said, we will not buy this land unless we talk about how will we collaborate in the next 10 years so it becomes possible to give this land to the grandchildren of the people we're buying it from. It's not guaranteed we will give it to them. Notice we're giving them money to then have the opportunity that if they steward the land with us, we'll give it to their grandchildren. Now, this was one of those really subtle, really complicated processes. It took six months. It took six months to just complete the purchase so that we could begin proving to them that we're gonna do this. And now we're a year and a half in restoring this piece of land. So that's part of the story I wanna tell is, what does it mean to create these collaborative frameworks of cultural healing and decolonizing a land purchase? Which is not finished, by the way. We have, we have 10 more years of work to earn the trust of the people we bought the land from. And so you can just sense that. Now I just wanna talk um, briefly about this future space and then open to questions. So this will be like a provocation. I think what I just said is a pretty big provocation, but I want to give you another one just to throw it into the mix, which is that for those of you who have watched things like Bitcoin and Ethereum and all the Ponzi schemes and all the bullshit that is in the crypto world that we're rightly, rightfully skeptical about, what you may not know is that in that same space are things like understanding how to govern the commons and create local economies, what it means to combine governance and finance for local projects what it means to create distributed leadership across the community and engage in community philanthropy. Like there are a whole bunch of things around community-led development by the people to restore their own health, sovereignty, and capacity to govern that have a lot of decentralized governance tools. And I'll give you one example. Within the crypto world, there's this thing called staking which is connected to validation, which is that when you enter into any of the crypto technology spaces, how do you verify the value of whatever you're investing in? Because most of them aren't connected to any real assets on the ground. It's like when they took the US dollar off the gold standard, it's not linked to anything real. So there are people who validate that transactions occur so no one can cheat you. And because this is inherently valuable, the validators receive money but they receive money because every time you make a transaction in these digital systems, they have to use computers to update all of the, the 
the accounting books, and this costs money. So they give a portion of those things called gas fees to the validators for helping to secure the data quality of the whole system. But then those validators are only able to do this because people stake the crypto money that they have to the validators through a thing called the liquidity pool. Now, you don't have to follow me for all of this. I just want you to understand that there are people who are maintaining the security of information in a system. Because that's valuable, they get money. And just like with banking, you pay transaction fees, or with a credit card, there are transaction fees. Some of these transaction fees go to the validators. And you can actually stake money to the validators to assist them in improving their ability to secure the system. And then you share some of the financial rewards with things called staking returns. This is just a thing to know. There's a way of pooling money in a way that supports the integrity of the whole system because there are people who are working to maintain that integrity of the system. Now, what's interesting is because that infrastructure exists, you could create one of these liquidity pools where all of the extra money that comes in goes to regenerative projects or goes to whatever you want it to. And by the way, this is called DAO. It's like, basically it's just a way of a contract that says, we all agree when we put our money here that we're gonna allocate money to something we care about. It's like collective investing or collective philanthropy. So I just wanna name that briefly to say that we have already been using some of these crypto tools to fund projects in Bari Chara. And we are now preparing through a thing called bioregional activators, which we'll be collaborating with all of you in the future. So don't worry if you don't know about it yet. It's like less than two weeks old. We're still figuring out what it is. But one of the things we wanna be able to do is when people are trying to activate their entire bioregions and they need some startup money that is like philanthropic donation that says we will support a local team to facilitate the weaving of projects in their territory and the cultivation of a landscape vision and to fund and support those projects as they're developing, as they collaborate together, it's really hard to find that money right now. Right. But, we, but with these Web3 crypto tools are designed exactly for this. And once we demonstrate them with on-the-ground projects, more people will learn how to use them. So I just wanted to bridge these two worlds and then hand the mic back. So in summary, there are ways of collaborating to decolonize uh, land purchases and land ownership related to on the ground regenerative work. And there are ways to create decentralized governance and finance through things like these liquidity pools, basically ways of using the infrastructure of a different financial system where the architecture of the financial system is set up where you can participate in decision-making. And this allows us to collectively own the financial system instead of Wall Street and centralized banks owning it. And so to imagine bioregional governance where some bioregional group in your territory owns and manages its own financial system instead of Wall Street and centralized banks, this is the promise of crypto. Right. This is the promise that has been lost by the Ponzi schemes, but all those tools have still been getting developed consistently throughout. So I'd love to just open it up here to discussion and I invite Ben to be the, the facilitator of our dialogue. And I hope those things stimulate a really nice, juicy conversation for us. Thank you so much, Joe. That was quite a provocation, a lot to take in and wrap your head around. I've heard these terms described. I, I, help, um, I've read about them and it still isn't quite sticking. And I, I came from, you know, my initial career was on Wall Street in the bond markets. So. Um, it just shows how kind of edgy and complicated this all can be. Um, but I get the underlying concepts that you're naming and, uh, and I'm sure others do as well. The, the process we imagine, this is the first of our um, conversation with a Wayfinder sessions, was simply that we would have people put some questions into the chat and we'd look at those as a set and then have you respond. Um, rather than trying to have a, a collective conversation with 40 some odd people that are here on the call. So um, I think we're going to just give that a try and see how that goes. Um, the other, you know, the other option sometimes is you just let people get on the mic and do that. But, but I, I think this is better if we, if we just use the chat and, um, and see what comes in. So we'll just take a minute and you can kind of catch your breath and we can all let what we've heard sink in, we'll slow down a little. Always something I need to remind myself to do. 
Um, and let's see what, what kinds of questions you pose and whether we see some themes or, or ways that you might answer them together. Uh, there are a lot of comments that have gone by in the chat as well. And I do want yeah. to mention too, in the, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. In, in the main room of, of the Kiko chat space that, that you get here with, there's a tab now for resources. And so a lot of these things like, like the film, La Paz Anonima and others you can share there. And actually an email goes out every day that gives people links to those, to those resources, I believe. Um, the discussion board definitely that, that sends out an email. Anyway, so if, if things are coming up, instead of just putting in the chat, dropping them into the resource list is a great idea. So we're getting a few questions now. Um, let's see. So what is the particular blockchain you're using is one that should be easy to answer. Um, yeah, I'll start with that one and say, I don't believe in using any one technology. I think we need to blend and combine them, but there is a blockchain infrastructure called Cosmos which for those of you who know is where region network hosts the region token. And there's a lot of promising work there, but also separate from blockchains, there's hollow chain and other things that have very different infrastructures related more to data sovereignty. And just to name that difference that different technologies serve different purposes, which is why we should not lock ourselves into just one. There's actually a very quiet conversation that only super tech geek kind of people would even follow anyway around creating bioregional blockchains. And I'll just name one group that's working with that is ReCommon, which used to be called Regenerative Community Land Trust, and they're based in Boulder, Colorado, just as one group that's playing with bioregional blockchain. Basically think of like managing all the data for your own information system as a bioregion. Just think of something like that. So, so rather than giving a tech answer, which I think would be the, we're too early in the days of all these technologies to pick one, but those are just two. And then I'd name one other, which is uh, Giveth, which is a platform that allows people to take staking returns from their Ethereum that they put in, that they can then donate to projects as strategic investment and philanthropy. So there's just a couple examples, which are then using um, like Python or other blockchains uh, that some of you will know, but most people would, have your eyes glaze over, like what the heck is that? So that'd be my quick response to that one. We had two questions that are getting some, um, some plus ones and plus pluses. Um, one from Melina, um, which maybe you wanna clarify Melina, on what resources have, be, have you been using with the conversations with the people in Barachara? And, and from Marta asking about scaling, um, and Marta Cerrone. Um, so what does that look like in the context that you're in scaling? And Melina, I don't know, do you want to clarify what you meant by, by resources in conversations? Um, yeah, what, what, what I am trying to get to is, uh, is how, how has been your interaction as a gringo in Barichara, trying to get into the cultural environment and 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 you mentioned a lot of the healing that this context needed and all the cultural thing but uh, i i wonder how have you been received and how it has been your interaction with them and uh, what resources have you been using even if there are local people that can and speak english or that you know like a kind of the bridges towards uh, this connection uh, with uh, with with the context mm -hmm. and uh, and and the response of the of the context to your interaction there. Yeah, this is a topic that we could talk for days about. There's a lot to say, so I will probably give an inadequate answer only because there's not time to talk more about it. Uh, because what you're what you're touching is so important. Let me start with the example of Ori Hindalagua when we started the negotiation is that there's a woman named Margarita, whose husband is from the UK, she's bilingual and speaks English, and she stepped in to help with the negotiation because she wanted to be sure that she was protecting the campesino culture. So she started from that place of being sure that I didn't intentionally or accidentally cause problems, like to displace local people by buying a piece of land, which is a big issue here. And so that was an example of a resource. It didn't come because she trusted me. It came because she knew me. And that's because her daughter, her son was in 
uh, forest school with my daughter. And that's how we initially met. She thought that I was a nice guy and didn't have specific problems with me, but she was worried about what might happen to the local campesinos that caused her to step in. And then she became a really important ally. But now I'll just keep with Margarita and flash forward a year because at the beginning of this year, I raised enough money to completely fund her family for a year and brought the money to her. And I did this in a really delicate and important way because a lot of the work that Margarita does is she kind of works in this blended space of trauma healing with women in the community and with transformation of local food systems. And a lot of the work with local food systems is related to someone in the family having ancestral knowledge of a specific native plant. Like grandma used to make this dish that we would eat. And then, you know, with this way that campesinos come to devalue their own culture, and then the young people go off to the city, she was trying to help them restore the value and the respect for these traditional kinds of knowledge. So she worked in these blended spaces, but that included bringing in workshops on how to process local plants, how to package them and brand them for the tourist economy. And she's ended up just touching the supply chains of the local food system in every way. So she's in this blended space that she works. So when I came to her around bringing money to her family, which I hadn't raised yet, I would need to go and raise the money. The context was that she had rooms in her house that were sometimes used for uh, women who were in trouble, which could happen in a variety of ways. There's a woman who's in a house where there's domestic violence and she needs to escape, or there's a woman who's dealing with drugs and other issues and is on the street. She just helped lots of people in this way. But I started having Earth Regenerators members come into Barichara, and some of them would stay in Margarita's house in these extra rooms. So this conflict arose. Should she give priority to local people in crisis, or should she help people who are doing regenerative work for the territory? And those people might be outsiders. And this created a lot of tension within her. So we started a conversation about what would it mean to bring money to Margarita that would turn this house, she actually owns more than one house, so which means she's wealthier than I am. Let's just turn some of these stereotypes around. I own zero houses, she owns three. And she makes money with Airbnb in one of her houses, which in Barichara, Barichara is one of the biggest tourist destinations for Colombians. Huge amount of money comes in through Airbnb. And so we actually negotiated that I would pay for her income from Airbnb so that her Airbnb house would be taken off the market and this other house where she did all of her community work would become a community le learning center and a community kitchen to transform the local food system. And then we would spend a few months figuring out how does she, pro how does she manage this space and invite different people to use the rooms. And so you can already see the kinds of resources that come into play. Margarita is one of the most trusted people in the community. She has a huge network of local people. She's also got rooms that outsiders could stay in or that locals could stay in. We're just mobilizing lots of different kinds of resources. And the key became, the key uh, process became, how does Margarita heal her own problems with money and guilt? As I paid her more money to make her space available to a lot of people, she's better off than most of those people. She's wealthier than most of those people. She's a Colombian who used to work for the United Nations in London. You know, she's Colombian, but, She's, uh, she's very privileged as a Colombian. And you can just see all of the schisms, all the problems that come up with that. But because we were also creating a territorial foundation, which we're still in the process of, and we were figuring out governance and how to bring money into the territory, everything she was doing in her house, which is now a community center, and as a community uh, store, that's called Casa Comun. Um, and she's been building networks of local producers and um, ways of bringing them to market and all kinds of interesting things. They were just mobilizing many different kinds of resources, some of them deeply local, some of them local in the Bogota Colombian who lives in Barichara, some of them in the way of the tourism economy, some of them with outsiders who just come to visit for two weeks, but that help these local projects. Like we had uh, an earth regenerator named Chad Monfreda, who's from the US, who's helped set up community currencies he came and spent two months here, staying in one of those rooms in Margarita's house. So he's like a resource to the community, helping them map the value flows of what was happening in non-monetary trust-based exchanges to help 
a particular product that margarita makes to come into being, which is granola. But the granola uses waste products like pineapple that is turned in just rotted and wasted, but they can dehydrate it to put it into the granola. And she helped bring in workshops to convert old refrigerators into food dehydrators so that local women could dehydrate waste food and turn it into high value food products. So all this sort of stuff is happening. I use this example um, to say, you can just start to try counting how many resources are mobilized and they're coming from every direction. That's the key is like, they actually don't start or end in any place. It's the circulation and the interaction among them that matters. I know Melina knows this because she does biomimicry work on the value flows and economies, but just expressing this outward to everyone else. After a while, we can no longer tell where the resources came from because they're continually circulating back and forth through different places in the local economy. Um, and this gets at the question of scale, is all of this is fractal. Our characteristic scales to focus on are individual projects, like Margarita's house as a community kitchen, networks of projects, like here in Barichara, there's a local group called Mujer y Vida, just means woman in life, which is about 50 campesino families that are trying to create food resilience. They've been at it since the mid nineties. So working across networks of projects in that way, and then organizing them around things like watersheds and other landscape features, which is another scale. And then all the way to the scale of our regional climate system or the cultural identity of the territory, which in this case is about 500,000 hectares of land. And then, inter-territorial exchanges, because we're also part of a network of seven territories in Colombia, each of which is creating a territorial foundation, which means they're doing their own governance of a territory, and we're part of a network of seven of them. And then with groups like Earth Regenerators or Regenerative Communities Network, planetary. So you can see that um, there we also are intentionally working with every scale just in each moment, we focus on the one that we need to take action toward. So um, I hope that starts to tantalize further questions. I know it opens a lot more questions than answers. And Melina, you, you've got to come and we, we should hang out. And you can just walk around and see all of this. You're going to love it. Y tienes muchos amigos aquí. Sí, yo sé, me hace falta ir a Barichara, de hecho. Um, but yeah, so are there other questions that have come in or how are we on there, time? Ben? There are a bunch. Um, we want to wrap up your portion within the next five minutes. I'll take another five minutes to just say some, you know, some closing words. We'll end five minutes before the top of the hour. And, and I just want to mention, I, I was mistaken on the schedule. We go into uh, the, the hangout is an hour from now in this room. So the next session on our calendar is 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 not in this room, which means that people could linger here if they want, if we can figure out a good way to um, to manage that. But I will be moving to the radical networking session. Anyway, let's stay with you again here. And the, the, just I'm trying to sort of link together some of these questions. You touched on on scale already with Marta's question. There, there's some about about governance and how that relates to scale and the distinction between traditional government, democratic government governance structures or government versus the kind of bioregional governance structures that you're creating. So, and how does leadership fit in with that? That's a question. Um, and, and then I think related to that is this challenge of how you connect up the network level to real on the ground development, um, which I think you've spoken to some, but, but maybe you could, Touch on that. Another another element I'm seeing here is about um, the third space, uh, you know, the the eagle and the condor space. And is there some other principles, technology, social or otherwise, um, uh, you know, and and patterns maybe that 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 you could name, even though probably this looks different anywhere it's attempted. Um, so with all of that, you know, and whatever you want to wrap up with, take another five minutes or so. And we know that this barely scratches the surface, um, but but um, we have more time. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to start by saying that um, something I've learned in practice, especially working with pro-social groups, with groups that learn how to deeply collaborate, is that the foundation of it all is the sovereignty of the individual. If there is someone who is just acting out their traumas as like a um, as like a, a psychological mechanism of defense they actually are not sovereign and they cannot co-create. 
And so the, the basis of our capacity to collaborate deeply is that the individual people who show up into the collaborations are either healed enough already, or the context is healing to them as they engage in the process that they gain sovereignty. And so when we talk about bioregional scale sovereignty or how do bioregions relate to things like the National Government of Colombia, which by the way, some of those 600 assassinations were done by government sponsored death squads. So just understanding how, how, how complex the relationship is between nation states and what we're talking about. Colombia is uh, exemplary for how difficult it is. Um, so, so just naming that, just naming that. And that complex, complex, complex. Complex, yes, very complex. <laughs> is that um, one of the things that is really important is that in biology, there are characteristic scales for governance. And those characteristic scales are the unified level of integration for information. Information integrates at a coherent scale. For those of you who know, or you wanna look it up, there's this thing called evolutionary transitions, which would give you an insight into how this moves across scales. So I'll give you two examples. You have a simple bacteria, a prokaryotic cell that doesn't have any um, organelles within it. Its characteristic scale is just that. But if you have a eukaryotic scale, a, a eukaryotic cell, which is 1,000 to 10,000 times larger, these things are much, much bigger. The prokaryotes are the ancestors of the organelles within them. And so you actually need each of the organelles to have coherence, and you need the integration of the organelles in the entire eukaryotic cell to have coherence. So it's in this way that I say there are characteristic scales. There are really levels of integration and modularity. And so this integration and modularity together tells you the characteristic scale. So let's just use an example. I'd mentioned Margarita's house, which is now a community kitchen and a community store. So the scale in one sense is a building, which is a house with some rooms and a big kitchen and a garden, and it's in the town of Baricha. But that scale doesn't tell you what it really is because what it really is is a network of projects across the territory and all their interactions, which has a characteristic scale of how many producers are in that shop, how many of the different land-based projects are able to relate to each other. So I'd already mentioned one of them, this group called Muheri Vida, which is about 50 families. So are 50 families the coherent scale? Well, not really, because that's just a loose affiliation of people. Because if you get to the level of the food dehydrators that I mentioned, there might be four or five places where someone set up a food dehydrator and their neighbors nearby bring the leftover food, like the pineapple that would have gone bad. And there's a characteristic scale of collaboration for each of those food dehydrators and a clustering of the food dehydrators around the development of a product, which is this granola. So you can see there are different scales. I don't wanna go and just continue mapping those because we just get lost in the details. What I wanna say is that the challenge is always when you move from a lower scale to a higher scale or when the higher scale becomes incoherent and breaks and you go back to a lower scale, which is like multicellular organisms have the breakdown between their cells called cancer where some rogue cells destroy the entire organism by basically taking life energy from the whole body in service to themselves. And so the lower levels of organization can undermine or destroy the higher levels of organization. Or greed within private multinational corporations can destroy a nation state or destroy a market. This relationship between scales is a universal challenge, regardless of complex system we're dealing with. And so the question becomes, how do we create holistic health at the scales that are needed? So I'll give you a really powerful example to close us today. Because last Friday, I was at an incredible meeting led by two local people, one of them Milena knows, because it was Felipe Medinas, our dear friend Felipe, who does a lot of work with children. And he's done a lot of work with transformation of conflict into peace, where he's worked with like, narco traffickers and guerrilla leaders with blood feuds and help them build peace. He's, he's really an incredible, wonderful human being. And now he does most of his work with children and peace 
together with deep ecology principles? How do you create deep nature connections to construct peace through the children? And he's working with another woman who just arrived here named Milena. Oh, I'm sorry, Melina. Melena's, I'm looking at you. Aha, Milena, not Melina. Oh, your names are so similar. And Milena works with kids on emotional and social development. And the two of them have created a pedagogical strategy, which is there's this 30,000 hectare drainage called the Barichar River. It's a dead river. It's got at least 15 tributaries. So it's got a natural scale of organization, this landscape scale of drainage. And they said, what would we do if we created standard curricula philosophy, not standard curricula, but standard curricula philosophy, where every educational activity in the whole territory working with kids is trying to bring health back to the Barichara River. And they're using the natural geographic scale of the river to organize education across the entire territory. So for example, one of the things they wanna do is take water walks where a group of, uh, of adults takes a group of children and they walk part of the territory to learn how the river works and how the river was hurt and what it would take to restore it. And this becomes a pedagogical perspective a way of designing educational experiences. So you don't just take water walks, you take water walks to restore the health of the river. And this is what organizes the coherence of all of the individual education programs, which have their own scale, around the scale of the landscape for this 30,000 hectare drainage of a river. And so I just wanted to use that as an example to say, there are naturally occurring, like I'm using my finger quotes, naturally occurring scales, like the drainage basin of this river, that we can self-organize education around. And then when we do that, there's another natural scale, which is the scale of a, of a teacher with a group of kids. <laughs> For those of you who have worked with five-year-olds, try and get more than five or six kids in a group, and they're all gonna just like break apart into their little activities because they just don't have the ability to stay on topic. But if you have two teachers and 10 kids, you can do it. So you end up with these characteristic social dynamic scales that then relate to the scale of this big watershed. And so you work across all of the levels by moving upward to the characteristic scale of the landscape and you let the landscape guide you. For those of you who know my history, I used to work with George Lakoff doing embodied cognition and cognitive science where the organization of information is the body. My mind is a dynamic process of my body. And so the body is an organizing scale for a mind. Here, the organizing scale for regenerative economies is landscapes. And the landscapes are literally the bodies of the economies. So here, the watershed is the body that can hold this. And so, so that'll be my way of, of inviting us to reflect and closing is how can we bring money in? How can we collaborate? How do we do wayfinding? What is radical collaboration? Well, if these children, are teaching the adults to restore a river, their deep collaboration is actually with the watershed itself. The primary teacher is the watershed. The Barichara River is the teacher that teaches all of the schools how to teach the children. But actually the children will mostly teach the adults because this decolonization process, um, there's a whole process of building conscience when the children tell you you should care about the water, the adults start paying attention. Whereas if the adults tell you you should care about the water, they just get judgmental and fall into their mimetic camps in their political boundaries. And so the children have a, have a back door into constructing collaboration that the adults don't have. And that's one of the insights that Felipe had for his work. So, so this is just an example of that with a concrete incarnation. We now have a pedagogical strategy to organize education for an entire bioregion where the children want to bring the river back to life. And they're gonna try and get the adults to collaborate with them. So I hope that gives some, uh, some yes. things to think about. <laughs> oh, just a few, right? It's a good thing we've recorded it and, and people can, can chew over this. It's um, that, the, you know, you're, you're manifesting the complexity, but also it all comes down to that, you know, the simplicity of just the children care about the river and want to bring it back and the children of the future and, you know, water is life. So I, I think in some ways that's all we need to understand, right? And, and, and we can all find our way in, in, at that level. Um, thank you so much, Joe. I don't know if you are 
willing and able and interested in sticking around in, in this line, um, I, I can hand things over to Melina to continue holding this space and, and move into um, another session that's happening in the Radical Networking Zoom. Um, I did want to say, so just, just, is that possible? Do you want to stick around? And I'm happy to stick around for a few more minutes, but before everyone goes, I just want to show this, a copy of my book, but not because of my book, but because Claire Atwell is with us as a participant, and this is her artwork. So one of her textile uh, designs. And I just want to give a huge shout out to the artists and say, thank you, Claire. Um, that was why that's sitting next to me. Um, <laughs> love Claire's still here. I hope she is. Um, but I just wanted to name that the role of the artist, as we had mentioned that at the beginning when I gave a shout out to Amber. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Claire. Great. Well, thanks for, for, for being willing to stay a little while. And then maybe Melina, after, after sure. Joe, you want to stick around, you can continue holding this space for people. I'll make you the host. I just want to name as we're leaving, first of all, the session that's happening in, in, the, in the room for radical networking is a chance to go deep with, with just two or maybe three other people for an hour in some conversation that embodies patterns, uh, transform patterns of communication. How do we reframe our own thinking about our path and our journey uh, that, that, that's a form of decolonizing, if you will, using powerful questions. Um, so you're all invited to come over to, to that space if you like. Um, you just go uh, into the Kiko chat interface and, um, and scroll down on the left-hand side and you'll see radical networking uh, at the bottom there, one of the workspaces. And when you click that, you'll see a different join Zoom button to, to follow us. I also want to name, you know, that we have, again, multiple, two, two weeks more of sessions, many more conversations with Wayfinders later today, Martin Araneda, Mich uh, Michelle Maloney from Australia, Helena Norberg-Hodge, uh, who is in Australia, but has the, the fabulous network Local Futures, and we heard from her yesterday, uh, as well as many participatory sessions, the Radical Networking, Open Space, where you can be your own Wayfinder or a Wayfinder and step into that role and invite conversations with others. Um, and an offers and requests marketplace with multiple sections as well as an online repository for those on the HILO platform. And so that's also, we're gonna have our first of those live sessions later today. And then all these different explorations of particular uh, opportunities in different categories, Melina's leading one and, and, and others too. So that's just a quick overview. I'm gonna turn it over to Melina. Thank you so much, Joe. And perhaps I'll see some of you uh, for some radical networking um, over in that room. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Yeah, so if uh, if some another two minutes or five minutes, I don't know how, how long you want to stay here, Joe, but I think that you inspired a lot of people. So if uh, somebody wants to, uh, you know, like pop up and uh, make another question, if uh, if Joe is willing to, to be here a little bit, and I am just doing this because... Uh, this is creating a, a big, uh, you know, momentum. So I just want to help uh, to land and to, you know, like uh, embody this, as you said. <laughs> so, yeah, does anyone else have a question you'd like to ask or um, topic you'd like to explore further in the next few minutes? I know Jesse has raised her hand. Yes, Jesse. Go ahead, yes. Nice to see you, by the way. How are you? Anyway, please. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, still muted. Should be uh, in the bottom of your screen on the left. You'll have an option that says mute or unmute. I just ask you to unmute. So you should, you yeah, you're, yeah, oh wait. Oh, you did it again. Just click it one more time. No, we cannot hear you, you are on mute. Okay, click there. Mute. There you are. And All right, now, yes. Now, and now I have to click the, you, you, it kept muting me, I'm sorry. Anyway, the, the quick question, very, very good ideas, Joe. Really good ideas. Um, uh, Barachara seems to be uh, the the city seems to be on the edge of a of a plateau 
and the river valley to the to the east of it, um, no, no, west of it, to the west of it, and downhill. Where's the land that you that you purchased? Is it is that in the uh, lower Barachar Valley or or upper or where? If you is there follow, way? yeah, if you're on a map and you follow, like on Google Earth or on Google Maps, and you follow the ridge line that goes from Barichara to Via Nueva. It's just above Via Nueva on that ridge line. And the ridge line is the edge of the plateau. So you right. see the plateau drops into the Chicamocha River is what that valley is, which comes from uh -huh. a little canyon to the north. One of the largest canyons in the world, actually, the Chicamocha Canyon. Do you see it there? Well, I, I, I don't see the other city anyway um the they uh, i see the uh, rio sanchez river that the Baichara uh, drains into or used to um i don't see the other river or the town that you mentioned um yeah i guess i don't have enough detail anyway i don't need to take up your time yeah i can show it to you another time uh, I'd love to go on to Lisa and then Eduardo. Lisa, welcome. So, we cannot any... hear you, you're on mute. I just, let's see. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, yeah. there we go. Hello. It said the host is not in uh, participants to unmute themselves. <laughs> but Joe, I just want to give you a ginormous, huge huggy. I found you in Earth Regenerators. Recently. Yeah. <laughs> you uh, watching the Barichara um, activist, the, the video that you made about what you just described. Um, the participants that included the Native American, or not Native American, excuse me, the indigenous peoples of the area there. I literally cried because I, I studied with a Native American and a Mayan traditional shaman and uh, uh, right to the crypto, talk about the whole gamut. <laughs> you cre you literally created that. I was like, how the hell did he do that? I've been all around the world into many different countries and, and communities and just what you nailed in the very end is that all, all so many people, they have these dreams of wanting to fix and save the world and either A, they don't want to pick up a thumb to do it, B, they think they're the only one there to do it and they're the only one who knows anything. And it just, I, and I went, it's funny because I dropped out of school for genetic engineering a long time ago, or I probably would have made the bologna virus or destroyed our food supply. But I said in the notes, I would love to clone you and, and make you a lot more of you. Your energy is contagious. The question I have for you, and you're a ginormous soul, and it's an honor. I'm honored to have found you in uh, Earth Regenerators, and I'll be there more. Um, but uh, how long has it taken you? From I'm I'm from the state. I haven't lived in the states in 20 since 2014. But I originally moved to Costa Rica, and I dreamed of doing exactly what you were doing, and just ran into so many of the blockages. That you made it sound very simple, but what all those things you scooped over <laughs> very quickly in, in a simple sentence, it's obvious how many years and, and, and the energy you've put into that and make it seem very simple for everyone. How much time has it taken you to get to where you are since you first arrived in Colombia? I'm curious. Well, I first arrived in Colombia in June of 2019 when we co-facilitated with a wonderful Colombian leader named Luis Camargo to launch an organization called Colombia Regenerativa, which Melina is also a part of. And so I arrived then, and then our family came to live in Colombia in November of 2019. So it's been three years, which is actually really fast. And I think that <laughs> our, our secret to coming really fast is our daughter is really cute. And, <laughs> and kids related oh, the children to each other, are the key for sure. And then connecting to the parents through the kids. I mean, I just yep. not only mean connecting like networking, I mean, just getting to know people. Like we made so right. many friends through having kids or having a kid. And so, um, but really what's happened here in Barichara is very special. And anyone who's been to Barichara would know this is a very special place. And the people who live here are very special people. So it's not like uh, I'm able to do this because I'm so amazing. It's, I have my thing that I do that's very helpful. But without all of the local projects and all the local people that I was just shining a light on, 
I mean, it's like it's easy for me to fundraise when I'm pointing out Bio Parque Moncora. Like, look at these two amazing women in their 70s and what they've done. You know, it's like it's very easy to, to recruit resources when there's something that's that beautiful. So, so I think it's, it's really important to, to see how the amount of time it takes us to do things is maybe less important and more how well do we belong to wherever we are, wherever yep. we go. And I had a profound sense of belonging in this landscape that surprised me. I'm not from South yep. America, but something about the landscape really did speak to me and connect with me. And I've been a servant to the landscape ever since. Uh, and so I just consider it a great honor to be able, like I'm currently, as of today, we will finish the purchase of a very important piece of land called Las Albercas. And I'm gonna be a guardian of two pieces of land until they become collectively owned by the community. And it's just, uh, um, there's no way that you can say how much time that takes. It's just, it's, uh, right. in my case, it's been three years of building trust so far and we're on a long road. Um, but uh, my daughter was really helpful. She was three when we arrived. Very cute and already on her way to being bilingual. Um, that that helped a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. No, I lived in Costa Rica. My son was three when we moved there, and it was the kid that got me tied in with everyone as well. But your language, especially, and I, I, I am a big funder. There's no one person. It's, it's, it's a collective. And you even used it in your language talking about that. And that was amazing. But it's an honor. I don't want to take any more time. I'll connect no. with you in Earth Through Generators and, and give share you with everyone else. But Thank it's amazing you. to meet you face to face. Take care. It's a pleasure. Eduardo. Bienvenido, hermano. I just want to mention something before Eduardo talks. Yes, please. And you. it is um, it is that uh, it is really powerful to be able to honor uh, the place when the place is ready some people mm -hmm. arrive and we cannot expect to do this work uh, at anywhere as as if everything was equally or equal homogen you know like and, and and what is happening is that earth the planet is just like a making these notes of organization so it is kind of for us to sense that as well and to be able to navigate it and to be what just joe said you know like the the uh the spotting light on seeing what locally so our ability to see what it is going on in our bioregions actually is a better um uh tool or you know like a, is more needed because it is not like kind of landing somewhere where it is ready and we have to just go it's just leading really um uh, tune our 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 regard our our view into what is really important in every bio region so really really nice to hear that eduardo y de acuerdo contigo <laughs> eduardo, <sí. laughs> All right. So super interesting. I mean, I, if I had to quote important phrases, I think we'll quote the entire set of phrases that you used to speak throughout the whole hour. <laughs> That's amazing. So, uh, but so my question is, um, this is really, you talked about um, this whole implementation is uh, being fractal, right? And the whole foundation you mentioned is the so sovereignty of the individual. Either he has to be healed or the environment is to be conducive to his healing. And this is fractal, right? So you mentioned it being at the level of uh, individual projects, uh, networks of projects, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to the planet. Um, traditionally, I mean, this relates to the level of energy into, in which humans live. I mean, we live in uh, levels of energy that has not been very conducive to results. Whenever we deal with problems through fear or pride, it's conducive to creating loss. And that is almost a guaranteed formula for somebody to look for ways to go around the law to keep doing things for their own interest. So in the absence of this structure of that results in, in laws and constitutions, uh, how do you deal with incoherences, what you call information incoherences through the system? Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you deal with possibly a lot of people um, living in a low level of energy around fear, around uh, distrust, mm -hmm. around uh, pride, maybe anger, 
um, as opposed to moving up towards the positive energies. Um, hmm. I wonder, how do you deal with that? This is a really important question. And I want to just broaden the context for a moment and then come back. The broadening of context is we are in both an unprecedented moment in the history of the planet and a moment of tremendous loss. And so there's a secret to having something like optimism or healing or love or these positive sentiments, which is that the positive sentiments have to be connected to what is authentic. So for those of you who know the work of Joanna Macy, who says that grief and love are both the same, you basically grief and love are just different moments of the same relationship. If you love something, you will grieve. If you grieve, it's because you love. And so there's this deep connection. I say it this way because raising the level of our consciousness or our energy can easily be thought of as being more positive. But in the Western world, like I'm from the US, this incredibly individualistic, capitalist, consumeristic culture, being positive could mean well, I was just, someone just stole my money, but I'm going to put on a good face and look like I'm successful. And yeah, and they sort of fake it. And so being positive can be really toxic in that way. And I want to name that distinction because I think what you're getting at is that real positive energy is authentic. And authentic energy expresses what we love. And what we love includes what we're losing like mourning and grieving and feeling the connection. And then from that place, we release the feeling of control we need to have for the loss. And we're more free to love. And what I found in practical terms is that it is that deep grieving process that enables us to regenerate ourselves. So the, the practical, like really basic example of this is sort of a joke that I pull a lot of invasive grass. I'm like, I'm gonna go pull some grass to work some things out. And then as I'm pulling the grass, I'm opening up an ecosystem and we're planting a forest and there's a lot of stuff happening there. But mostly I just have a pickaxe and I'm pulling grass. Well, why am I pulling grass? Well, because my body just needs to connect to something meaningful and simple while I let my body calm down when I'm stressed or scared or feeling pain. But I don't ignore those things at all. I actually make the time for them while I'm pulling grass. And so I think that this way of bringing the energy levels up is really about, this is going to sound familiar to those of you who know you're Joanna Macy, it's all about connection. It's like authentic connection brings out this healing energy because it has a place to relate to the rest of the world. And so what I see as being the, the way of dealing with that incoherence is partly if you have a fragile process, protect it from the incoherence of others. Just don't invite them in or keep them out or whatever you need to do. And then the other is, as people enter into the spaces, they need to enter in a way that can transform and integrate their feelings. Not ignore them, not bypass them, don't filter them away. Like, so this means all of the regenerative work is trauma healing, which is why I mentioned it so much. All of it involves that. It's not reducible to trauma healing, but it cannot ever be done without it. And so the place where the healing energy comes in is in our ability to deepen our love in an authentic embodied way. And this happens in small groups, this happens in networks, this happens at territorial scales. It's sort of like we're doing that, that perspective is present at all scales. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot more to say about that. I'll just let that sit for future conversations because I want to invite Bill and then Felipe to share. So, um, Melina, is there anything you. you want to add before we go on to Bill or Eduardo? No, something? go ahead. No? Thank you, Eduardo. Bill. Thank you. Hey, th thanks, Melina. Thanks, Joe. Um, Joe, thank you so much. Um, and I have a quick question following up on your application of pro-social. Mm -hmm. um, so we at R3.0 have been using pro -social, uh, the pro-social matrix and in particular an embodying version of that that uh, our facilitator Jennifer Nucci uh, innovated. Um, but we've gotten, uh, it, we're doing this work with the Global Thresholds and Allocations Network looking at carrying capacity thresholds globally. 
Um, we got real resistance on that from um, some participants uh, from the global south uh, who were perceiving pro-social as a global north um, uh, colonizing influence. Uh, and so I just wonder, um, uh, you know, do you, ha have you encountered something similar to that in the use of pro-social specifically? And if you have any thoughts on, you know, how, how to, to be with that, um, with that critique while also holding the value of, of pro-social as a methodology. Thanks. Yeah, this is a great question. I know we've talked briefly about this before. I have not personally had any resistance to it just because of the relational spaces I'm in. Um, but that's partly because I'm also a participant, although I'm not a very active one at the moment, where a pro-social world has a Latin America project and they're collaborating with organizations all across Latin America to, to train pro-social and to also evolve it, to incorporate things from the Latin American world. And when I look into that space, some of those people may be having these challenges. And what I think is the problem is not pro-social per se, but it's the problem of the idea of outside expertise. Notice I'm using my finger quotes again, because sometimes outside expertise is exactly what's needed, but it being needed does not mean that it's invited. And now I wanna step back to something that I think is more important than whether it's pro-social or any other body of knowledge, which is the difference between being welcome and being invited. This is almost gonna sound like Buddhism for a moment. Um, because it's, I've learned more, most of my perspective on this from Buddhism, uh, is that being welcomed and being invited are really different. Being welcome is, it, it'll be nice if you're here. We'll be nice to you if you're here. Being invited is, we really want you here. And for me, I find that difference to be somewhat vague until I put it into the context of something like a romantic relationship. If there's someone you're interested in dating and they're like, you're welcome to hang out, they're not really wanting to be with you. Right. But if you're invited, they're like, I really want to have a relationship with you and see that difference is, is huge. It's really huge. So if we look at pro social instead of a romantic relationship, well, you're welcome to talk about pro social here, meaning we don't really see that there's a problem that you can help with. We don't know that we want your help. We don't know who you are. You might be pushing an agenda. All of that comes because of not being invited. And in some way, even if it's accidental. And so the inquiry I would offer you is not how do you present pro-social differently, but how do you notice the difference between welcomed and being invited in all the context you're in? And, and let that be your meditation, because I think that's where you'll get to clarity. I have not brought pro-social anywhere that it wasn't invited. And that's why I haven't had any problems. It's not about pro-social. And you, know, you think, like I said, about 500 years of colonization in Latin America, um, there's good reason to be suspicious of experts or even the idea that someone outside knows better. Like what we positioned as Refi Bari Chara was we told outsiders, come and bring your tools and we'll figure out how to do regenerative work and landscape scales. But it was a, like a wink, wink, um, bait and switch. Because when everyone arrived, we were like, God, all these Web3 people are about to learn about Colombian cultures. <laughs> you know, like the locals are going to teach them a ton and the outsiders will just be humbled and realize that they have so much to learn from the local people, which is exactly what happened. And only from that place of humility could this real collaboration begin. That we, like I as an outsider could invite the web three people, but it wasn't until the fire holders, the indigenous women invited the web, the web three people that we could collaborate. Because I couldn't make that inv invitation, only the local people could. Even though in a vague sense, I'm a local as someone who lives here for three years, I'm not a local like a Colombian medicine woman. And so we found that the depth of trust and that transferal of trust, when the medicine women trusted me, so they would actually hold a fire for us, that built a bridge where they could welcome the outsiders, still on their terms. And then they invited, like one of the most important moments for me during the Refi Barichari event was when the two women in their 70s who created Bio Parque Moncora, they asked me if they could present their budget, which means, could they ask outsiders for money? And I was like, hallelujah, the local project can ask for resources on their own terms. Yes, please, come up to the front of the room. It's like that, we, you know, it's their local sovereignty to decide if they wanna ask for help on their terms. And this is being invited. 
these two women, Camila and Vicky, invited the outsiders to raise money for them. And that changes everything. So, so I hope that's helpful. I'm sure you get what I'm talking about. Um, I want to add something yeah. to that, Joe and Bill, because I am from Colombia. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and, and for example, the example that, that, that Joe gave us about uh, getting in contact with the context with Margarita, this, this woman, this a privileged woman working in London and having a, three houses in Barichara, this is not a campesina, you know, like, so, so it's kind of, of what I want to say is that, yes, this is 500 years of colonialism, but Latin America is deeper, con is, is deeper connected with nature than Euro Europe, even, or, or even uh, North Americans. Because, because the colonization has been in such a way that they, the extermination of people had been really harsh for United States, like a super difficult mix. And even if we have in the Spanish doing inquisition in, uh, in, in South America and Central America, we had much more mixed people and metis uh, and, and we hold a disconnection at many points. Mm -hmm. So when something like a, an structure as pro-social or sociocracy or something landing is kind of, we are more willing to compare it with our relationship with nature and it is easier to do it. So, and, 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 and let's say that, yes, we need help with order, but at the same time, we are more connected in how things can emerge and how self-organize. And I think that that's the conflict. It is not just like a, like a, um, no one thing you because you are foreign. No, it is not like, a, oh, because, because we are so prevented. No, it's because we don't agree, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that's authenticity is what it is showing up there. And maybe that, that cultural cross is what is needed. It is not adopting things. It is, it is really being from any size in a, in, a, in a Metis mindset of, okay, so what is the point here? And maybe you cannot name it like that, but just got, trying to get into touching these fibers from every point and every perspective is the power of what we want to do and uh, you know like just trying this kind of 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 you know like a mixing methodologies like for me when i when i hang out with more like i am in the mix i am I, i'm bridging worlds as well and when i when i am with americans everything seems to be more structured like uh, we have an appointment at that time and we are doing this and okay, I have to go and poof, the party's finished, you know, like <laughs> with Latin Americans, we, you know, like uh, we are just flowing easier. Like uh, it feels so much flow that it is like uh, when, when Americans go to the room because they have to get up at six. So they are just preparing and, you know, like uh, this kind of boundary of individualism. And Latin Americans, are, we are just like uh, drinking a, one more beer and just like, a, you know, this kind of mood, it is not one better than another. It's just that, that the linking with flow is different. And I think that it is really important for, for the more colonized cultures in the world, which are Europeans and Americans, you know, like, because you have lost many, many years ago the connection with Aboriginal and Indigenous people and nature. So, 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 so it's kind of a humbling space for let's do this structure, or let's use this structure, like trying also to rebalance things. And, and, and I think that it is really powerful to, to there, there is a huge potential and emerging opportunity for, for everybody to do radical collaboration. Mm. Thanks for that, Bill. Gracias, Melina. One thing that I've learned about Latin American culture is that 
it helps if you realize what music and dance are like on this continent. Take a salsa class and, 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 so, and then contrast it with the waltz. And then you'll get a sense of what Melina is talking about. What's absolutely beautiful about the people of Latin America is how they dance. And I mean, metaphorically, not just literally. Yes, they're beautiful dancers and all of that. But I mean, the way that the flow, like I'm an improvisational person. I know Bill is too, he does contact uh, improv and other things, but it's so much more when the whole culture does it. So yes, Melina, gracias por explicarlo. Um, Felipe. Felipe. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Well, I'm Felipe, also from Colombia. And actually, you gave me the perfect preamble to what I wanted to share because, uh, well, I'm also connected to the Miska people and we have like a, a, a kind of a prophecy and at the same time uh, an explanation of what happened in the colonization. And is that uh, the colonizers came and took the gold, but they didn't really took the, the real treasure that was the wisdom be, be behind uh, the, the gold. Mm -hmm. So actually, the what what we are experiencing right now, it's also not like comparing cultures, especially not ancestral cultures, because what is happening is, is really special. Actually, uh, I could put direct examples and, and, and we have learned a lot of the native people from South America have been even empowered by the North American natives that have bring knowledge like sweat lodge and ceremonies with tobacco. So it's it's not it's not about like the who's right and who's wrong, but what, all that we have forgot as humans in general, and how in this uh, eagle and condor North and South uh, reunion is that we are remembering together as one family, as one tribe. And well, I'm very happy to to be here, and, and especially because I'm also very connected to the Barichara project through Tyler a couple of years ago, and and through some friends that went recently. And I know what well, I also wanted to add to what have been shared is that uh, we are also on the same line to to propose like a commons network globally, uh, and we have much more things to share at at some point. <laughs> but well, I try to share a bit in the chat the, the links, but let's try to keep an open channel. I don't know exactly where, maybe through Melina, maybe Joe, to, to really weave much more deeper, because especially uh, as, as a Colombian network, I mean, Latin American network, uh, we can pull things together. Mm. Uh, thank, you much, <laughs> thank you very much, Felipe. And, uh, and, and please, everybody, like uh, we can connect in the map, through the map, uh, this is the in the it, it is in the in the in our platform in Kiko chat and uh, you have a different link also to the, to go directly there because these connections that that's what it means like for example we um Joe is a wayfinder he has been just finding paths and 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 and, and going through those but at the same time you know like a for the regeneration movement and maybe joe i will i will explain this to you because i am really interested in what you think about it but what we what what we are trying to do is not to be just the leaders well it's like a, we we need the empowerment of the whole community in order to lead anything that emerges mm -hmm. and that will make the flexibility and the resilience of the movement for by regional regeneration um strong enough to really be able to not be greenwash or uh, taking into another thing that we are not resonating with, you know, like a kind of a faking a a, a anything that it is um, um, coming into our way because actually there is this colonizing thing that happens all the time and we are trying to move into a space of real healing and healing the traumas and understanding how to do that. And um, so, so it is kind of helping each other to be very powerful at our scale, at our bioregion, at our, so, so our connectivity is the most important thing right now. Our relationships is what we need to focus on. So, so everybody here is really welcome 
to to participate in that map and to meet Joe, meet me, meet Felipe, meet Bill, Lisa, and you know, like I just let's connect and uh, and and bring everything that it can be done as an emerging opportunity. So yeah, I'm really happy to to yeah. participate in this with you, Joe. And well, everybody. gracias, Melina. Gracias, gracias, y Felipe también. Um, Maybe to close the session off, since we've been going for about 90 minutes, uh, I just want to briefly tell, I'll, I'll keep this very brief, tell the story of my relationship to Regenerative Communities Network to show you what Milena is talking about, how this weaving of relationships is so important. Because I was brought to Costa Rica in the end of 2018 and through most of 2019. And during that time, I was asked to join the team at Capital Institute with Stuart Cowan. The two of us were the two people that were managing the manifestation of the Regenerative Communities Network. And we had two big problems that were really difficult to overcome. One was Stuart kept trying to find funding to support our work and no one would fund us or understood what we were doing. You know, no one who had money that we were connected with and it was very frustrating for him doing that. And the other was almost 80 bioregions reached out to us and we were completely overwhelmed by the desire for bioregions to talk to each other and we did not know how to cultivate leadership and coherence through our relationships to help us do that. And so it was like, it got hit by a tidal wave of possibility. And at the same time, it didn't have the capacity to manage, manage itself. And so this was just like a perfect storm of intention and complexity not being really well aligned with each other. And what's happened between then and now is several different networks have continued evolving. So Earth Regenerators, which started as a study group for chapters of my book that I wrote after I had worked with Regenerative Communities Network, and I incorporated a lot of other knowledge too, but the coherence of my story was what I'd learned being part of this network. And then I did work that seemed to be completely, like there's Joe's network and there's RCN and they're separate and they're not. You know, just They were just having their own coherence of, of capacity building. And then Bill, who's here on the call with R3.0 is another massive network of collaborators. And then there's transition towns and global eco-village networks, and you could just go on and on. There's so many of these. And what we need to do now is actually have the capacity to weave our human relationships so that bioregions can collaborate with each other all across the planet in a coherent way. Because there's just so little time to get this right. So like my partner Penny and I are about to go to Colorado, where Boulder, Colorado was one of the hubs of the Regenerative Communities Network in 2019. We're going there to recatalyze that same conversation again, just as this summit is ending. And then we're going to go to Costa Rica in January, but with a different group that wasn't part of the Regenerative Communities Network before, but is also in OSA, which was one of the hub locations. And then we'll reconnect with the people who are there. And it's just because we did not have the coherence then to do the deep sustained collaboration we need to do now. And I love that this summit is naming itself as radical collaboration and wayfinding and some of the other frames that they have very mindfully brought into this space. Because what we're doing now is figuring out how to sustain this collaboration. And now is exactly the time we must do that. So Singh Felipe is connected with Samara through with Tyler Wakefield, as he mentioned, which is connected to the Seeds community, for those of you who know, which is a crypto regeneration community. And so like you can just see, it gets really confusing to look across all those networks. But if we organize ourselves as bioregions, we hold the complexity of our own landscapes and we create the coherent ways to relate to each other. And the landscapes will hold our complexity. So we're in that moment right now. It's ours to lose. We better get it right. So um, that's the way I wanted to say the way finding is how to do that. And I hope this session has been helpful. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you everything you said and the, the, the willing of, of really join the whole thing and uh, and um, yeah, exactly the spiral. So thank you everyone for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, you have the, the, the calendar. We have more open spaces and more sessions today and the next 10 days, <laughs> nine days. <laughs>
<laughs> so this is this is really a lot of a lot of things to do and a lot of people to connect with. So just take the best you can and and navigate it. Um, we are here to support anything you you will need. So thank you very much, Joe. Yes, I thank you, everyone. You Muchas gracias a todos. In the next one, we could all do it in Spanish. Porque hablo español, but no en español. All right, thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Gracias. Chao a todos.